Chicago. Glad to see you, and glad to see you in this room. Um, my name is Nina Rosenstand. I am a professor at the philosophy department uh, under the social sciences department here at Mesa. And uh, this is our social sciences occasion lecture series, which I have been hosting for over 10 years now. And uh, we usually also had a talk in October, but uh, our uh, speaker was not able to come, so that's why this is the first talk in our 2014-15 uh, season. And it is also the first time in several years where we are back in our original environment in the LRC uh, 435. And uh, it's a smaller room, but it is more intimate and uh, I think uh, a lot cozier. So uh, I'm happy that you are here, and I'm happy that we are here in particular. And I'm very happy that I'm going to introduce the speaker here. So a couple of things that I need to say that uh, with uh, the Social Sciences Occasional Lectures um, is a series that uh, have uh, sometimes uh, speakers invited from outside, very often speakers invited from Mesa, from the Mesa community itself. And uh, it uh, generally um, allows speakers to introduce or to um, expand on their research uh, for, other, for uh, uh, other faculty. And we generally uh, allow students to attend also. Uh, so that means that uh, I can, at this point, uh, welcome our speaker, who is uh, our, um, uh, one of our history uh, teachers here at uh, Mesa College, Jean Keller. And uh, she has been teaching history here at Mesa for four years and 12 years at uh, uh, the Palomar uh, College of um, the American Indian Studies, so or at Palomar. And um, uh, she is uh, she is a published scholar, uh, greatly with uh, her dissertation published by the Michigan State um, about uh, the Sherman Institute, which you will I think also be hearing about. Uh, at least to some extent, uh, the, uh, the book is called Empty Beds. And uh, for 15 years, she's been editing books and publishing papers about American Indian issues. And uh, she has been uh, is, uh, focusing on especially the issue of diseases in uh, off-reservation uh, school environments. And right now, she's working on a uh, project about smallpox. Uh, so I want to welcome Jean Keller and the title <coughs> Away From Home. Well, I sort of feel like I'm in one of my classes so because so many of my students are here. Um, I thank you for coming today. I'm going to be talking to you, thank you, about something I've been studying for a long time. And um, usually when I give lectures, I talk about disease. That's my research field, disease in off-reservation boarding schools. But I decided to switch it around a little bit today and just give you, uh, most people don't know what an off-reservation boarding school is. So today I'm going to basically talk to you about um, why they existed, the history of Indian education, and uh, give you an idea. For those students of mine that are here, um, I have a, I'm not really a PowerPoint person, but I'm a visual person. And so I have a PowerPoint full of primary sources. That's all it is, is images and some quotations. And so I'll probably turn the lights off. I want to do a little introduction first. But for those of you who are in my class, now you see how it works. Um, also, one thing I'd ask of you, and I um, tell my students this incessantly, is when you listen to what I have to say today and look at the images, I'd like you to personalize it. I tell my students all the time, personalize history. Don't just say, oh, well, that happened to somebody else. Think about what it would be like if you were that person, if you were those children, that family, uh, Richard Pratt, whatever, and try to personalize it. So um, I'm going to turn these off so I can seamlessly go into the PowerPoint. This uh, lecture is about identity and how off-reservation boarding schools shaped Indian identity. And identity is a pretty easy thing. If any one of you asked, what, somebody said, what's your identity? Who do you identify? What's your self-identity? It would be pretty easy to just uh, recite a litany of who you are, a mother, a student, a teacher, a whatever. But for American Indians, the question of identity has been uh, difficult and confusing uh, for the last several hundred years. 
Uh, it seems like it couldn't be, and it shouldn't be, but ever since Columbus discovered the New World, there has been a concerted effort to change American Indian identity. And so, um, something that seems so simple is actually um, very difficult as American Indians from that early time, 1492, have been faced basically with two choices, either to change their identity and thus assimilate, or if they choose not to change, then they face extermination. So we all know what the means of extermination are. We know about the diseases that decimated millions of native peoples. We know about massacres. We know about wars. But what mechanism was used to ask, uh, to force American Indians to change their identity, uh, to assimilate, to be uh, more like the others instead of the others? And that mechanism is education. Uh, Off-reservation boarding schools were certainly not the first form of uh, education for Native peoples. The first form was uh, through and from about 1493 until about 1870. Religious indoctrination was the way that Native peoples were asked to change their identity. Um, uh, the Catholics got first dibs on Native souls. And, uh, but eventually all of the different denominations were involved because it was just sort of too good to be true. They could kill two birds with one stone. They could save Indian souls, but they could also sort of pave their own way to heaven by doing what they felt was uh, God's work, which was converting these savages to um, Christianity. So the first schools were actually mission day schools. And those were set up um, as a way to educate children um, and missionaries set these up throughout the country and they focused primarily on uh, teaching children to read well enough to read the Bible because it was believed that if they could at least do that then they would be able to be more easily converted to Christianity and there wasn't much more emphasis than that they could do um, some kind of work around the Mission Day School, but it was an extracurricular kind of thing. It wasn't required. Um, then the switch to uh, day schools, and the day schools were originally um, operated, again, by religious entities, but they were funded by the federal government. And the point of these uh, didn't focus quite so much on religious teachings but also on vocational training because the government wanted Indian children to learn how to do something. Um, so they emphasized a little bit more stringent academia, uh, religious teachings, and there was also usually some kind of vocational training, a limited amount because mostly these were children at these schools, but that was included in these day schools. So, these, the education that was uh, proposed, that was sponsored by these religious organizations, were they successful in changing Indian identity? Were they ch successful in making them uh, go, as they like to say, from savages to Christians? Not really. Uh, of course, there were some that uh, became converts. But the point was that these were day schools, and the children still lived at home. So they went to school in the morning, usually, and then went home. Their primary language was still their native language. They lived in a traditional tribal setting. And so it was one of the greatest laments of the missionaries is that what they were teaching just didn't take. That all of their good work was pretty much wiped out as soon as the kids left the school and went home because they went back to the blanket. That was the phrase that they used. So um, the government then becomes involved. As early as 1918, uh, the United States government created what was called a civilization fund and they allocated $100,000 for educating 
uh, the children of Western Indians and the Indian parents themselves, the point was to teach the children things like uh, how to read and write, but to teach the parents how to be farmers, and that was the big intent. They felt that if they could teach these Western Indians how to be farmers, uh, they wouldn't pose such a threat once it came time for people to be uh, going through Western expansion. Uh, by 1870, the federal government had taken on full responsibility for funding Indian education. That doesn't mean they ran all the schools, but they then provided, uh, Congress allocated $100,000 a year for Indian education. So um, with this change, with the federal government becoming more involved, there's two new kinds of schools that uh, are created. One is a reservation day school. And that was a school established on a reservation, and it was similar to the mission day schools in that the kids, uh, these were the children, went to the schools and they learned how to do things like um, reading, writing. It was an elementary school level, and usually they, there was a schoolhouse and the teacher's quarters and a garden, and the children were expected to work around there to maintain things, and that was their version of... Um, vocational training. Um, and then the second kind was a reservation boarding school. And this was uh, modeled after one that the Methodists started in as early as 1839, but the first government one, funded one, was in 1860 at the Yakima Reservation. And the reason for the reservation boarding school was that the reservation day schools didn't seem to take the kids kept going home. So they said, well, the day schools the little kids can go to, but we're going to have the older kids come and live in a boarding school on the reservation. And what they did is they would have academic instruction half the day and work experience half the day, although there was a priority on the work experience. And the point was to teach them uh, skills that would be useful living on a reservation or at least minimally uh, assimilating into white society. So uh, you have the problem solved of kids going home, and this was thought to be the solution because they didn't have to worry about them going back to their to the blanket. So did these two kinds of education funded by the government that didn't focus so much on religion but on assimilation, did they succeed in shaping the American Indian identity? Not really. And the reason for that is because the kids were still at home. The little ones went to the reservation day schools, and when they were done, they just went home. The ones in the reservation boarding schools, if they felt like going home, they left the school and went home. If their parents decided to come visit, they came and visited. And so the same kind of problem uh, kept occurring. And Indian educators really were perplexed. They said, what else can we do? We're trying so hard to teach them basically to be white, to assimilate so that they can function in American society and they keep going back to the way they live. And so the American Indian identity might have changed just a little bit because you had the added education and vocational skills, but it still remained that of American Indian. It hadn't really been successful. So um, what happens is a man named Richard Henry Pratt comes into the picture. And uh, when he was, Richard Henry Pratt was a Civil War veteran and a veteran of the Red River War in the Plains. And he noticed in both wars that the Indians that he served with, the longer they were away from their tribal environment, the more like regular soldiers they became. And he saw that it was that that made the difference, whether somebody became an American or not. 
And so his view from watching, from uh, being with these soldiers in both wars was this. Kill the Indian, save the man. Interestingly enough, Pratt was, uh, instead of having a military bent so much, he had one, he was a progressive thinker. And he actually believed that um, Indians were technically no different than white people were. It's just that they had not had the opportunity to be exposed to white culture, which he felt was superior. So what he decided to do was an experiment. What he did is he volunteered at the end of the Red River War to take control, and this is in 1875, to take control of 72 prisoners of war. And these were uh, primarily um, Cheyenne, there was some Kiowa, their Comanche. And he said, I will, I will take charge of them. Because he had this plan in mind. And he said, we need to take them to Fort Marion. Fort Marion was an ancient fort in St. Augustine, Florida. This is it. Uh, it was built um, in the late 1600s, or in the late 16th century, and had been abandoned for many, many years. And so he thought that this would be the ideal place to take on his experiment of separating Indians from their tribal existence. And so he took them to Fort Marion. On the way there, they thought they were going to die because they went over the Mississippi River and according to their beliefs, going over certain bodies of water were the things you did on the way to essentially go to the next life. And they get there. There's no furniture. There's no beds. There's nothing. They sleep on the cold stone floors and they are waiting to die. And Pratt wakes them up one morning and he, they think he's going to kill them. But what he does is he cuts their hair, he bathes them, and he puts them in military uniforms. And that's the beginning of the experiment. And they don't really know what to do about it, except that they still feel that they're going to be killed, because in traditional native beliefs, the only time you cut your hair is when you are mourning. And so cutting the hair was a big deal. And what he did is he created an educational program where above all they learned to speak English. He trained them in vocational skills. They actually went into um, the town and helped citizens. They gave uh, local ladies lessons in archery. And he, um, he encouraged them to convert to Christianity. And he saw that this worked. He said that as long as they are separated from the bad influences of a tribal existence, they will easily assimilate. Mm -hmm. And so he felt that this was um, a success. So in 1878, their term of imprisonment was over, and many of them went off. And there are some one that said, I want to live in a wooden house because it will be easier to be good. And another one said, give us our wives and our children so that we can be good white people. Uh, there was one person that became a deacon in the Episcopalian church. Um, they had various levels of success. And there were several that he wanted to continue their education. But nobody would take them. The only place that he could find that would take them was the Hampton Institute which was an industrial school to teach uh, African-American freedmen how to do industrial and agricultural things. But he didn't actually feel that his Indian students belonged there because as progressive a thinker as he was, he still believed that uh, Indians were superior to <coughs> the freed slaves, the freedmen that were at that school. And so <coughs> he decided that he wanted to create his own school. So he used this experience as the foundation for his school. And this is an important part of it. This is a photograph that he took the day they arrived in Fort Marion. 
And he documented that for a particular reason, because this is what they ended up like. And you can see the difference. This one thing, photography, created the foundation for the model of his off-reservation boarding school. So, uh, Pratt decided that he was going to start a new school using the experience that he had learned at Fort Marion. And so he went to Congress, he went to Friends of the Indians, he lobbied everybody. And he says, give me 300 young Indians and a place in one of our best communities and I will prove it. I will show you how to solve the Indian problem. And so finally, uh, he had proposed uh, allowing the school to start at Carlisle Army Barracks because it, had, it was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, had been abandoned for a long time. And he said it was in a perfect community an agricultural community full of um, law-abiding people who had no prejudice against Indians at all. And so it would be perfect. Well, he got approval for that. This is it fixed up a little bit, but really about the way it looked by the time he got there. Um, it was not built for being a school. Um, it was... Um, an abandoned army bar barracks, <clears throat> but he felt that he could make it into the same kind of success as um, Fort Marion. So what he had to do then, once he got approval, is he had to start recruiting students. How do you go about doing that? So he went back to the Plains, because that's where he had had the most success in uh, getting to know leaders. and. This is long, and I'm gonna, I don't expect you to read it all, but it was important to show you this because this is his recruiting speech. The War Department told him that if he was going to recruit students for this school, he was required to go first to Red Cloud and to Spotted Tail because they had the most influence in the Plains. And if he could talk them into sending their children, also Red Cloud had no children, then they felt confident that the rest of the leaders of the Plains Indians would gladly send their children. So basically, and I will just paraphrase this, um, first of all, Red Cloud was very much against it, but he didn't have kids anyway. <coughs> Spotted Tail said, the government cheated us and took away our Black Hills. They lied to us, and we do not want our children to be like that. I'm not sending my children. And this was basically his response. To paraphrase it, he said, if you would be able to read and write, the government couldn't have lied to you. And you had to rely on an interpreter to tell you what was in the treaty. If you had been able to read and write, that wouldn't have happened to you. You wouldn't have lost your sacred Black Hills. Do you really want your children to be in that same position? And it convinced him. He sent his children. And that made a big difference to some people. There were already people like, this is, this is a leader named American Horse. And this is actually a picture taken of him at Carlisle with a teacher, with his children, and with other children. And he was a sophisticated leader that had at least 10 children. And he believed that sooner or later his children were going to have to live with whites whether they liked it or not. And that it would be better for them, better for the truck, <coughs> if they were educated. And so he uh, was a forceful proponent of sending the children of other Plains leaders to Carlisle. So um, on October 5th, 1879, the first batch of students came to Carlisle. And interestingly enough, they arrived at midnight at the train station, and hundreds of local people who lived in Carlisle were waiting for them, greeted them warmly, and walked them all the way to the old barracks. This picture was taken the next morning. And it's important because he found success with Fort Marion using photography. 
and it formed the foundation of his success at Carlisle Indian School. So the first class had 82 boys and girls, um, and by the time the, the school formally opened on November 1st, there were 147. Uh, the youngest was six years old. The oldest was 25. Most of them were teenagers. Um, Two-thirds of them were the children of Plains Indian tribal leaders. They were setting an example for others. Um, there were 84 Lakota and 52 Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Pawnee, and 11 Apaches. So um, what he did is, and the rest of this, I, I'm not going to, I have a whole bunch of slides, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on any of them, but I want you to get the sense, because I could tell you in a million words what happened to them at Carlisle, and you would never get it as much as you will by looking at these images. So anyway, what he did, um, originally his intent was that children would have to be 14 years of age or older because he planned on teaching them vocational skills so they could uh, be self-sufficient. But what ended up happening is children as young as four came to the school and he had planned on the program being five years. Instead, most of the children stayed until their early 20s. I want you to think about that. If you are a parent or if you're a child, you're somebody's child, I want you to think about what it would mean for your child to leave you at four years old and you don't see them again until they're 20. Or if you're a child, think about the first time you went away to school. These children were terrified. Everything was so different for them. The smells and the sounds, and they didn't know where they were, and their parents were not there. A six-year-old. I still remember vividly the first day my kids went to kindergarten, and I cried all day long. And I got there two hours early waiting to see their little faces, and I filmed every single thing. <laughs> so I know. So what he did is, this is the first class, and they were the um, first for him to put the next phase of his experiment on. And so what they did, what he did is, again, uh, he cut their hair, and he took all their clothes from them, bathed them, and put, uh, for the boys, uniforms on them, military uniforms, and the girls had generally long black skirts and white blouses. He described this group as absolutely wild Indians. They still had buffalo robes on, they had red flannel or beaver pelts, beaver skin wrapped around their braids, and that was the big thing. So after they had had their hair cut, and after they had put their uh, new clothes on, then he would have the second batch of photos taken. So this uh, was one of his favorites to show because these are Apaches. They were in the next group that came. Uh, they came in 1880, and this was four months after they were there. You've probably seen this. This man's name is Tom Torino. He is a Navajo. And he was sort of the poster boy for Carlisle in that they said, see what happens when we take these savages, these wild Indians, and educate them. Look at the intelligence in his eyes. And so he, they had pamphlets made showing especially Tom because he's so cute anyway. But people began to believe. Before he started this school, they said, you can't educate Indians. And there was a pretty common idea that the only good Indian was a dead Indian. And so he says, wait, give me a chance. Look what I can do. This was actually a postcard that was made um, to promote <coughs> Carlisle. And they'd say, we took her and not only is now she getting married to a handsome person in a tuxedo, but look at the difference. And this was widely dispersed throughout the country as an advertisement for his experiment. After they had their photographs taken, and they were sufficiently cleaned up, all of the children at Carlisle were taken to a room, 
and one of the teachers wrote names on the board. And the names were things like Robert and Rose and Luther, and they were instructed to pick a new name. You can't very well civilize Indians if they're allowed to have names like Standing Bear or Kills a Hawk. And so the children, the majority of them didn't even speak English, were instructed to pick a new name. They didn't even really know what they were doing. Luther Standing Bear, one of the children, he picked Luther. He, said, he wrote later that he felt like he was counting coup on an enemy. And counting coup, for those of you who don't know, that is something that's done in battle. Uh, and so the children no longer had their names. They had to go by another name. I want you to think about that. How would you feel if all of a sudden you didn't get to go by your regular name? You had this foreign thing that you had never even heard before. Some of them could not even pronounce these new names, and yet they were required to have them. Um, once they had their new name, they got into this very highly structured um, routine with, uh, this is an example, this is the dining hall. And for the dining hall, they used bells at the school. So you had bells to wake up, bells to get dressed, bells to go to class, bells to go to the dining hall, and the students had to stand behind their chair until a bell rang, then they could sit down, then a bell rang, and then they had to say grace, and then a bell rang, and then they could eat. And everything was highly structured, and it was formed like um, uh, military. They had units, and they had um, companies and officers, and they had, even if somebody had uh, committed a bad <coughs> offense, they were called, it was called being court-martialed, and they were punished uh, for whatever they had done. Uh, for, and this is one of the uniforms that they had for the boys at Carlisle. Half the day, the students went to classes. Now, the difference between Carlisle and the other reservation schools is, because, is that Pratt, instead of giving elementary level education, he had education that he felt was on par with the education provided by white students. This actually is the boys' debate club. And there's one for the women. The girls' debate club. Labor conquers all things. Uh, as you can see, this is a class of the little children. There were more and more little children that went to this school and to all of them. Whoops. This is one of my favorites. Uh, they even had anatomy classes where they learned how the body worked. Males and females together. Yes. And that's something that was at Carlisle is that if there was something for the boys, there was the same thing for the girls. This is actually a penmanship uh, class where they practiced writing in English. And when the children came there, very few of them spoke any English at all. The few that had a, a, a cursory kind of um, understanding of English were used as translators for the rest of them so that they could get into the mode, but only English was allowed there. And if children were caught speaking their native language, they would be punished badly, uh, beaten. He also felt that it was important that these Indian children be introduced to the finer things like art. Art especially uh, because he felt that civilized people knew about art. Now when you're looking at these, I want you to think back to those before pictures so that you can really see how their identity is changing. The second half of the day was for industrial training for the boys or domestic training for the girls. Uh, industrial training would be anything from carpentry to blacksmithing, uh, making wagon wheels, making shoes. And I want to go back to that blacksmith thing. They're taught this very one small thing is so significant. Indians didn't shoe their horses, ever. Americans and Europeans shoed their horses. And so one of the first things that they did 
is they taught the boys how to make shoes for horses so that they would be able to come into a more uh, civilized way. Uh, girls were taught things like how to iron, how to sew, how to weave, how to take care of children as though they had never taken care of children before or done any of the others, how to cook, how to bake. Uh, the boys made all of the shoes for all of the children at the school. The girls and some boys in Taylor class made the clothes and the shoes for the school. And in that way, they, also, they learned a skill, but they were also self-sufficient. Girls learned uh, how to set a fine table, how to serve food, how to have proper etiquette when you have guests. Uh, there were also exercise classes for both boys and girls. Pratt believed that um, exercise created strong minds and strong bodies. And they had these. This is the girls. You can see that they are in rows, um, as are the boys pretty much. And what they would do is this served two purposes. Number one, the big focus at Carlisle was on creating individuals which is antithetical to the traditional way of thought, which is each person is responsible to and for the group. At Carlisle, the belief was civilized people are competitive and greedy and individualistic. And so things like exercise were taught for, first of all, to make them healthier, to make them compete against each other and as a PR mechanism, they had, especially the girls, they would invite people to come and watch this to show what the school had done. Anybody that can do those kinds of hard things has to surely have been uh, more advanced than they had been when they got there. They also had team sports. This is the famous team of 1916, and here's Pop Warner, and here's Jim Thorpe. Pop Warner, for those of you who played Pop Warner football, he got his start teaching Indians at Carlisle Indian School. Jim Thorpe was voted the most important, the most talented athlete of the 20th century. And here they are. Interestingly enough, um, and we have also the baseball team. Because these kids were usually a little bit older, especially <coughs> the football team, they didn't play other high schools, they played the Ivies. And so they played Yale, and they played uh, Dartmouth, and they played Harvard. The uh, Sherman team, which is my school out in California, <coughs> played a football, team, a football game against USC. And by halftime, they were creaming USC so much that the little whiners got off the field and said they had other stuff to do and went home. <laughs> uh, music was a huge part of Carlisle because they believed that music suits the savage beast. And they believed that by providing musical training and musical instruments for children, it would make them calm and civilized. But it was also used as a huge PR thing because they took the bands on the road. And they had one, this is the girls' mandolin and guitar group. They entertained, they invited people to the school, said, look what we did with the Indians. They could play music. And if we just had more funding, think of how much more we could do. And so the sports teams, the exercise people, the musicians, and the drama people were used as a public relations tools. Um, they actually had several plays where they were dressed up like Indians. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were also dressed up as pilgrims and had to play that. They had reenactments every year of Thanksgiving, but all of them were Indians. They also had an outing program. The outing program basically is what we would call an apprentice program. So the students would go out during the summer usually, and these guys were building a ship. Um, they would work in households, they would work in factories, they'd work on farms, and this was their experience. 
the people who lived around the schools loved it because it was pretty inexpensive. They were not always treated well. Uh, in many instances, communities did not like them and would refer to them as niggers, or brown niggers, or red niggers. Uh, church was still an important function on, at least after Carlisle got started and then the way uh, other schools went is when they first came to register and filled out what was called the student registration book, they were asked, are you Catholic or Protestant? Whether they understood English or not. And they had to pick one. And from that point on, they either went to mass or services. And they became Christian by virtue of being at the school. Uh, one of the things that was appealing at the school was health care. Uh, on the reservations, there was abject poverty. And people died all the time. And one of the things that got people to have their children come to the school was because of the promise of health care. Of course, uh, it didn't always work. There were epidemics at all of the schools. Carlisle became known as a death factory because Pratt was so in such a hurry to get them in there that he neglected to give them health checkups. And kids came to the school who were already sick and they transmitted the diseases to other kids. And some of the children died because they gave up the will to live. They were so homesick. They were so lonely. And many of them stopped eating and just gave up. And those children are buried here, as they are at all of these boarding school cemeteries. Another reason that parents sent their kids there is because they had guaranteed shelter. This is a picture of the dorm room at Carlisle. It was clean, it was orderly, and they felt that that was better. And before I go on, you might have noticed, I've said, the parents asked for their children to go. It's a common misperception that the government stole Indian children and put them in these schools. They did not. I know of only one case with the Hopis where actually the army held the parents hostages <coughs> until they agreed to send the kids to the schools. Children had to apply to go to these schools. Their parents had to apply to let them go and how heartbreaking is that? But the problem was on the reservations, what was the alternative? Living in poverty, being sick, not having enough food, not having shelter, and so they did it for the good of the children. And as a mother, I understand that. And that's why this has been such a personal kind of thing for me because as a mother, I always think of what I would have done. One of the other things is that they had plenty of food. Each one of these schools had a farm that provided fresh produce and dairy food. But the problem was that traditional native people's diet didn't include dairy food. And at the time, it's estimated that over 75% of the children were lactose intolerant. And yet, they had to drink milk, buttermilk, butter, cheese, all of those things. And if you're lactose intolerant or know somebody who is, you can imagine how horrible that was. But they also had uh, white flour and sugar. Their diet completely changed, and that was the beginning of the health crisis that many Native peoples have today with diabetes and heart disease and hypertension. Um, they were taught about nutrition and how you get the best parts of certain animals. So these were kids learning to be farmers and dairymen. This was another PR thing. And this was sent out and said, look at all these noted Indian chiefs. They all have visited. They've all given their stamp of approval. They've sent their children. And if these guys are good with it, shouldn't you be? Shouldn't you support us and shouldn't you send your children to us? You saw the first picture, the first class, the first 82 children that came. From 1879 to 1918, over 10,000 children went to Carlisle from 140 different tribes. 158 actually graduated, having gone through a full program. And so you see the children from the tiny little ones. This is one year's class. 
And so it shows you that this was perceived as a success. This was the first graduating class. Um, they thought that everything was going to be different after that. You can see that they're sort of like excited in a sort of somber kind of way. And weirdly enough, do you know why they were somber? Because they were sad to be leaving. They were sad to be leaving. Um, this was their newspaper. I only have like three more of these things. But I want you to note here, this is indicating the past life. The old, the teepee, the horses, and now what is he? He's become a farmer. And this was an issue about the success of civilizing Indians. And this was pretty common, too. This is a picture, this story in this magazine is about this girl who was a student at Carlisle, and she went back to visit her tribe on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and everybody just thought she was splendid. It didn't usually work out that way. Again, this is a really long thing. And you don't have to read it, but I'm going to tell you basically what it's about and the reason that I'm ending it with this. You need to think about the parents here because the children, I think you've seen from those images that their identity was shaped by what they learned, by where they were, by who they were around. But it wasn't just the identity that was shaped of those children. It was their parents. It was of their clan, or their band, or their tribe, or their nation that suffered from them the loss of their presence in the fabric of their life. And so it wasn't just the children, it was everybody involved. And you can imagine how devastating that was. What were the ramifications of this? I think that the biggest thing that uh, was the ramification of this is the loss of what I call the ties that bind. The ties that bind are the memories you have of growing up, of uh, birthdays with your family, of Christmas, or playing outside, or whatever. And these children didn't have that. Because for the most part, they spent their entire elementary school years, their childhood, uh, their adolescence, away from home. And according to Pratt, that was necessary. They had to give that up. Their parents had to give that up in order for them to be assimilated, for them to be less other and more like others. And so what they did is they had surrogate brothers and sisters, the other students at the school. And they had surrogate parents in the faculty and the administration. Uh, and that's where their memories are. At Sherman, um, every fall they have an alumni day. And there are people in their 90s that come, and they gather under the oak tree and they sing the Sherman fight song with all their friends. And they have sent their children and their children's children and their children's children, and there might be seven generations all singing the Sherman fight song. Because the thing is, that's where their memories are. The second thing that is the most critical is loss of language. If you have a loss of your traditional language, how do you communicate with the ones that you love? There was a man named Sid Bird who went to the Genoa school when he was a small boy. And when they finally let him out, he went home. And his grandparents were waiting for, that, for him. And he was overjoyed because he missed them so much. And his grandmother ran to him, and she was crying and crying. And she was saying, my grandson, my grandson, I've missed you so much. And he stopped, and he realized that he had no idea what she was saying. And he vowed then to regain his language. Loss of language is what assimilation is all about, period. If you lose your language, you lose your culture. You lose the ability to communicate, and that's why these schools were so successful. Because English was what they learned. Can you go back? Can you go back to a place that you haven't been your entire life and pick up? 
No. And the ironic thing was that the promises made to these leaders of these tribes, send your children to me, I will teach them to read and write, and they will come back and they will help you in this tribe. It never worked. Because those coming of age things, those things that make you a leader, those things that make you an integral part of the tribe, they had missed out on it and nobody even accepted them anymore. And did they want to stay? There was a girl named Elizabeth who went to Sherman. She was a Hopi girl. And she loved Sherman. Loved Sherman. But she had to go home. She finally graduated when she was in her 20s. And she went back. And her parents were so thrilled. And she didn't really speak much of her language, but enough. to She remembered enough. And her parents, her father brought her in for the celebratory meal, which was spread on a blanket with a common bowl, which is traditional. And she looked at it and she said, are you animals? Nobody eats like that. Don't you have a table and chairs? And the father, being a father, wanted to please her. So he goes out and he rounds up scraps of wood and he makes sort of a, sort of a table and brings out other dishes. And she writes about this and she says, it was still horrifying to me, but I understood he was trying to help. So then it's time to go to bed. Her mother brings her into her room and Elizabeth said, certainly you don't expect me to sleep on that. Because again, it was a traditional way of basically a blanket on the floor. She goes, civilized people sleep in beds. I'm not sleeping there. So her father, again, goes out with and scrounges up some burlap sacks and fills them with hay, covers them with a blanket, and she says, it still wasn't a bed. I am so horrified. My whole life I've slept in a bed with nice clean sheets and a soft pillow, and now I'm reduced to sleeping like this. But I understand that he's trying to help. So the next day, this was the big day, the mother says, I'm so excited to show you what I've been doing. And remember, this is sort of like hard to communicate. And she brings out this big chest. And when Elizabeth had been born, there had been an arrangement of who she was going to marry. And so the whole time that she was at Sherman, her mother had been collecting all the things that she would need for her wedding and for her next life. And her mother was so excited because now the wedding could take place and she would be all outfitted. And Elizabeth looks at her and she goes, I am an educated woman. I am not marrying him. And she left. And she went back to Sherman and she became a teacher. And I think that story, as much as after all these years of telling it, it breaks my heart to say it. I think does the best job of explaining how these schools worked. People were changed. But the problem was that they weren't really. There was a common saying that an Indian in a suit is still a redskin. And so they were caught in this sort of nether world where they weren't really Indian anymore, and they weren't really white anymore, or ever. And so they were in the middle, and they weren't accepted by either. And so you have this generation of students that went to these schools that really didn't have any place that they fit in. And so it's true that their identity was shaped, but it wasn't fully shaped so that they would be accepted by really anybody. And so that is why these schools were so successful, more so than any other assimilative process in American history, to the point where these schools became obsolete and the children that had gone to them could be integrated into public schools where they became just like anybody else. Um, and it's interesting because when I took my PhD written exams, one of the questions was, did assimilation work? And I said, yes, it did. And I used this as an example. And when I had my orals, uh, and I got a high pass on it. It's high pass, pass, low pass, or fail. My examination board said, you know that question, that was a very controversial answer, that assimilation worked. How do you explain that? And I said, well, I have three people 
with PhDs uh, who are tenured professors with the University of California sitting here and all three of you are Native Americans. Well, that was the end of that. So, <laughs> anyway, I hope that this has um, told you about something that you didn't know very much about at all. I usually, when I lecture, I usually lecture about disease, but most people don't know about this part of history, and so I thought it was important to give you something to think about. So, any questions? Yes? What does uh, Sherman in Riverside, I think, on 91 and mm -hmm. uh, Adams and mm -hmm. there about? What, what, it still exists. I know my sister was there. It body. does. What, it's one of only four boarding schools, but now it's Sherman Indian High School since 1970. And Sherman is where I did uh, my uh, research for my PhD on Paris Indian School, which was the first in 1892, but focused then on Sherman. Um, and it was, it started in 1902 as Sherman Institute. And that is still there, but here's the ironic thing. Now it's going all the way back. They teach kids traditional basketry, uh, ethnobotany. They teach them traditional languages. They have Apache dancers. They have Kawea bird singers. And now the school is teaching them how to be Indians again. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Did I do such a fabulous job? <laughs> John? <laughs> what stopped the federal government's support for these? Well, even when Sherman was built in 1902, and Sherman was the last school built, there was a feeling that they weren't necessary. Sherman was a different kind of thing. Basically, it, was, it involved a lot of high power lobbying. The federal government still supports the schools that are there now. The Bureau of Indian Affairs basically does two things now. It uh, takes care of all the educational things, and it takes care of like um, what we call the fiduciary duty, lease payments, stuff like that, for resources that are on tribal land. But they still provide funding for Indian education. It's just that the boarding schools, after Sherman, uh, they basically sort of petered out because the kids were assimilated enough that they could go to uh, public schools and the government didn't feel that there was a need to keep them separate anymore. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, I thought the paradox with regards to bring your child here for health care, but at the same time you keep mentioning that your emphasis is on disease. It is. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about your research regarding having all these kids crammed into these tight quarters. And you know, I never started out uh, being interested in it. I didn't even know what these were. I have always been a disease person, um, and my research field was uh, epidemics of the reservation, removal and reservation periods. And I had a, a seminar in graduate school where I had to write a paper, and my mentor professor said, well, why didn't you see if there was some disease at Sherman? And I go, Sherman? What's Sherman? And he goes, you know, and I go, you mean the school down on Magnolia? And he goes, yeah, it was a boarding school, started in 1902. And I go, well, I've seen the Sherman kids walk up and down the street. Everybody talks about the Sherman kids, but nobody really knew what the school was about because it's all fenced in and it looks like barracks. So I said, okay, okay. So I started doing research until one day I saw a newspaper, uh, November 2nd, 1904, that said, one small sentence, there are 30 cases of typhoid fever at Sherman Institute. And that sentence literally started me on what I've done most of my adult life. Because the problem was, it's complicated, and that's usually what I lecture about. I've done everything from influenza to trachoma, tuberculosis, typhoid fever. One of the inherent problems was, in these original schools, is they were in such a hurry to get them in that they didn't check to make sure they were healthy. And all it took was one or two kids with the disease to transmit because especially in the early days there was so little money that they would sleep two and three kids in a bed. They would share towels, they would share pillows, they would share things because that is the traditional way of bonding with somebody, sharing. 
and so share a toothbrush, share whatever, and that transmitted disease. Those musical instruments, they didn't know enough to clean the mouthpieces of the instruments, and they would share those instruments and share disease. And a lot of the diseases, um, like trachoma, Trachoma is one of the most easily transmittable diseases ever. It was one of the first diseases they checked for at Ellis Island. Kids in boarding schools had it in epidemic. If you've ever had conjunctivitis or pink eye, you have an idea, this is about a thousand times worse. And the government actually, it was so severe in the schools, they had to have a whole um, program where doctors went around to all these schools. There ended up being 26 of these schools in 15 states and territories. And what they would do is they'd take a scalpel, the, uh, there are nodules on the inside of the eyelid, and they would scrape with the scalpel and then take copper, copper sulfate pen and cauterize. The problem was if they scraped too much, it caused scar tissue that would make the eyelid retract and they would be blinded. Tuberculosis was another one. Uh, tuberculosis was easily transmittable and a lot of times Kids would get it, and then they would go home periodically for a visit and spread it on the reservation. Speaking of which, the schools usually did not ch let children go home. And if you're a parent, or if you're a child, which you are, you can imagine never getting a, to go home. They said, you can, if you pay for the train trip from the school to your house and back again, they can visit. They discouraged parents from visiting because they said they were a bad influence on the children. That, and they really didn't want the kids going home because they said that they would, first of all, be tempted to stay at home, but second of all, pick up those bad traditional tribal ways. And so, uh, they basically were there for their whole lives. But the disease environment was also interesting. You saw Dr. Carlos Montezuma, who was an Apache physician, who actually volunteered to be the resident physician at Carlisle. This was the only school that had a resident physician of the 26. The rest of them had a nurse, a resident nurse, and then a doctor who was on a contract and would come and check on the kids. The first thing I ever studied was a typhoid fever epidemic at um, Sherman Institute, and they had, didn't even have enough facility for everybody. They had big tents on the lawn where kids were, I don't know if you know what typhoid fever is, but basically you um, have an extraordinarily high fever. It can go as high as 107 degrees. Uh, you basically have diarrhea and vomiting until you die. Well, they didn't have a doctor there. They only had one nurse, so all the kids and all the faculty had to take care of each other until they got sick, and then the next batch who had gotten a little better if they did, then would take care of the other sick ones because there just wasn't um, adequate health care. And at Sherman, interestingly enough, Harwood Hall, who was the supervisor, decided that he would, instead of building a hospital, he wanted to build a 6,000-seat auditorium because he was so sure that people would want to come and see the musicals and the plays and the concerts, and he figured that he had given good health exams to all the kids, so big deal, they weren't going to get sick, and they did. The problem was is that you have this close contact with the children, and there was never enough medicine to take care of everybody, and there wasn't enough um, health care practitioners uh, the most recent thing, I know I'm sort of dragging on, but you, those of you who are in my class know I'm a storyteller. I can just go on and on. I, the most recent thing I published and presented on is the nursing program that was at Sherman. And they hired a woman named Mary Israel, who actually was a doctor, but couldn't get a job. So they hired her as a nurse. And she gets there and finds out that she's supposed to be responsible for a thousand kids. And she goes, well, that's not going to happen. And so she creates a nursing student program based on what she had learned in medical school. She had never been a nurse, so she didn't know how to do that. And so she trained these girls how to do Materia Medica. They had to make all the medicines for everybody in the school. They did the operations. They did all the physicals, everything. And they, to the po at one point, 
they were so experienced and didn't have enough sick kids to work on, they were able to help work at Riverside General Hospital, aiding uh, in operations, because it so happens that the contract physicians at Sherman were the head of the uh, medical board in Riverside. And so they let them do that. They finally built a hospital that cared for all of the Indians in Southern California. And so because they were so successful, the superintendent of schools applied to the board, board of registered nursing and said, this is what our girls do, everything. We would like to have them be eligible to be registered nurses. And the board said, nope, sorry. In order to be a registered nurse, you have to have science classes. And so Sherman didn't have science classes because that was considered one of those sort of esoteric kind of things. So they had the option of either creating science classes for them or they could go to the public <coughs> schools, which they didn't feel comfortable doing. And so the program just uh, sort of fell apart till in the end they trained people to be orderlies and nurses aides. Mm -hmm. It's really one of those sad things because here they were doing, they were trained with medical school curriculum and yet it still wasn't enough because they still didn't have that kind of education. Any other questions? Thank you for asking. I could just chat about that forever. <laughs> I know you, you don't want that. No other questions? <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. No, 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 oh, no. Oh. Last more questions. <laughs> I don't get out of here that easily. Okay. Um, uh, just a couple minutes. I'm, I really apologize for that. But um, I noticed that the year, it's uh, 1879, mm -hmm. when Carolina started. Mm -hmm. and that is three years after Custer. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to say, uh, mm -hmm. there, was, there was such a feeling in the nation, uh, you know, really toward you know, all Indians. And, it's true. Uh, was, was there any kind of backlash in the community? He said that they welcomed them. Well, he chose Carlisle for a particular reason. By about 1838, there really weren't any Indians left east of the Mississippi River. Because of the Indian Removal Act, uh, the Cherokee Trail of Tears was 1838, the Seminole uh, 1858, but they're down in Florida. So for the people of Carlisle, they have this empty barracks, and the idea of having Indians there, they were actually quite excited about it. Because they, ha they weren't in the West, and that's the key here. They weren't in the plains. They weren't in the west. They were in the east. They hadn't had Indians around for a long time. So to them, it just seemed like sort of a cool kind of thing. And hundreds of them waited at the train station for those kids to show up, welcomed them, and walked them all the way to the barracks. And they were very welcoming to them. If it had been anywhere else, uh, and people that heard about this program because it became very famous, basically were naysayers. They said, you can't train Indians. You can't educate them. And at the time, especially people in the West wanted all Indians killed. So, and that was one of the reasons why so many leaders of the Plains tribes especially actually okayed sending their children to this school to keep them out of harm's way. Because they understood <laughs> that it was basically a question of assimilation or extermination. And uh, the point I really want to make is beginning when Columbus first came here, there has been, and De Las Casas comes the next year, there's been an effort to change Indians. There hasn't been one time when they go, oh, cool, you guys can be Indians and we'll be the white guys and we'll all live together. Never. They always had to be something else. They had to be, instead of savages, Christians. And instead of being hunters, they had to be farmers. And instead of this, they had to be this. And there was never a time when they could just be, when their identity could just be that of a native person. And I think the reason is because they were so different. They were considered others no matter what. There wasn't any, um, when the, when the Pilgrims and the Puritans happened to witness uh, Indians in body paint dancing and singing in a traditional ritual around a fire at night, they said they're children of Satan. Who else would do that? Was there anybody in Europe that had tattoos and piercings and body art? 
No. Did anybody else walk around with not many clothes on or uh, pieces of human hair off of their clothing? There were two other, and so they were never accepted. And that's too bad. But there has always been that desire to change them into something else. But it never actually worked because there was that stronger pull to just be who they were. And that's why Pratt's experiment was so important, because he got it. He said, distance education. Uh, distance education is the only way to have assimilation work, because you have to immerse them in American culture in order to wipe out the Indian culture. He meant that. Kill the Indian, save the man. And he truly believed that the only way you could do it is taking them away from home, which is why I entitled it that way, because that was such a steep price to pay. And for me, when I was doing this, uh, especially because my field is disease, I can remember one day I was sitting on my living room floor with all these primary source documents about these children and their illnesses in the letters home and the letters from the parents and the death certificates and all of that. And I was just crying and crying. And my husband said, you need to stop this. You carry them around on your back. And I said, no, I carry them in my heart. I have to be the voice for these children who never came home again, for the parents who gave up their children because they thought it was the best thing to do. And I don't want them to be forgotten. But it was tough. As a mother, it was very tough. It's tough for me to talk about it now because I can remember, like I said, the first time my kids went to kindergarten and that wasn't even a big deal. But when I told you at the beginning that I really wanted you to personalize it, my students here hear that all the time. I pound it into their heads. Don't think of this as words on a page. These are real people. And so I'm hoping that by what I've told you today, you see history in sort of a different way. And the thing is, the sad thing is that this actually worked. It actually worked. Because now you have people, uh, how many people, how many Indian people in this country speak their traditional language? Not very many. Most tribes do not. Interesting, at Palomar we have a person named Eric Elliott, who's a white guy, ironically, and he is a linguist and he is going around and teaching native languages back to tribes. There, weirdly enough, are uh, companies who go around and teach Indians how to be Indians again. They have workshops, they have conferences, you can learn how to take a sweat, you can learn how to smudge with sage, and you know who's doing the teaching? People like me, not me, but <laughs> white scholars who have studied this stuff and go, oh, I'll show you how you used to do it before we took you and put you in the schools and taught you to be us. So <laughs> it's a complicated issue. And the last thing I want to say is, most people come into this, when they first hear about it, they go, oh, that is horrible. That is a terrible, terrible thing. Those of us who study this know it isn't easy like that. It isn't good and bad, black and white. It's shades of gray. That there were families who did this because that was the only way to survive. And there were people who believed that there was no other choice. And for people living in abject poverty, what are your choices? Do you just say, oh, I want to keep my family together and too bad if they starve? There was a huge mortality rate on the reservations, especially infant and child mortality. If you see the children around you dying, do you say, oh, you know what, I want to keep them home with me and if they don't live very long, well, at least we got to be together? No. You have to make the choice that no parent should have to make. But they did. And so, and in some cases, like American Horse, he saw the future coming and he knew it was inevitable. And so he said, yes, this is what I want my children to do. And he sent his children. But it isn't a good and bad thing. Interestingly enough, I, I show a video about this to my students and I have them write a personal reflection. What do you think about this? Because most people have never heard of it. And it's ironic because Generally speaking, the majority of my ESL students think it was a good idea because it was a safe place to learn a language, a safe place to learn to acculturate, to assimilate. And so I've always thought that that was a pretty interesting way of looking at it. 
and it's true. So, any other questions? Okay. Well, first, thank you very much for presenting to us. That was great. Oh, um, I just was wondering, is there a large scale like, statistical study that's followed um, graduates of the boarding schools and looked at their life outcomes in terms of health and education levels and generations? Well, yes and no. The majority of students, <clears throat> and I mean the vast majority of students who went to those schools have never been heard from again. They don't go on. Especially the early ones. You might have heard I said there were over 10,000 students that went and only 158 actually graduated from the program. Yeah. And the problem is and Pratt was insistent upon them not going back to the reservation. He felt it was a personal betrayal if after all he had done for them, they went back to the blanket. And yet, they couldn't survive in the white society because exactly what she said. There was this feeling of hostility. Where are they going to go? Who is going to say, oh yeah, you're an educated Indian, let me give you a job. And so a lot of them just disappeared back to whatever. Because the problem is, especially if you were at a school for a long time, you weren't welcomed back to the reservation either. And in many cases, you couldn't even communicate with anybody there. So the vast majority, we actually don't know what happened to them. They just sort of go wherever they can go. Yeah? Um, thank you also. Um, so from 1879 to 1918, mm -hmm. did I get that right? 10,000 children approximately went through, through, Carl through Carlisle, yes. That was only through Carlisle? Yes. And only 158 graduated? Mm -hmm. What, what were the, the program? What was the criteria yeah. to graduate? Well, uh, Pratt had this five-year plan that you would go through five years of education, and that would make sense because originally it was supposed to be you couldn't go there until you were 14. So five years, you're 19, you're an adult, you go off. And so you had to take certain classes to uh, be skilled in certain things, and you had to go through this actual program. And not everybody did. Uh, some people did not ever do well in the classes. Some people ran away. A lot of kids ran away. A lot of kids died. And uh, some left and came back and left and came back. And so it broke up that pattern. So there were people that left the school with education, but there were only 158 that went through the prescribed program that he had originally proposed. Yeah. Well, you could see the difference in that almost last thing. That's how many kids were there at, in one year. Thank you. Was there another question? Nina? I am so appreciative that you have given us this impression of, of the whole ambivalence of the, the project. I've been interested in this for years, and I've never heard the positive aspect of it. I've always only heard the negative, uh, you know, the, the cultural genocide. Uh, you know, that's you know, what I've been uh, told. And uh, you know, just to, to uh, add a perspective, my interest uh, came about in 1976, where I spent the night on the Navajo Reservation mm. with a good friend because I told some of my students about the story, and we got lost. Uh, so we were on the reservation, we got lost, and it was nighttime, and we didn't know anything. And that's an easy place to get lost. Oh, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. And so we came, we came upon a little town. Uh, with uh, you know lights in in a building, and we knocked on the door. It turned out to be the local school, and uh, so this was I believe it was uh, Mexican Hat, I think mm -hmm. uh, could have been one of the other towns, and uh, so we were invited in, and it was a school teacher who was who was a uh, an Anglo school teacher, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the term would be, uh, and invited us in, and they just put us up and just made beds on on, on tables and chairs, and uh, you spent the night there. And then in the morning he told us that this was the first school on the Navajo Reservation and it had only been opened a couple of years earlier and everything was brand spanking new. And he told us about the boarding schools and how it was a major triumph that the kids could stay on the reservation with their families mm -hmm. and uh, not be deprived of their culture while at the same time becoming adept at, uh, at a mainstream American culture. Uh, I said that was where I got the impression that uh, it was a horrible, horrible thing at the time. With, uh, well, you know, so, so uh, let, let me ask you, do you know 
since this was, uh, I would assume that in the 60s, the kids on the reservation would have been shipped elsewhere. Primarily to Sherman. There was a whole Navajo program, okay. and no other tribal kids could go there. It was just Navajo then. So that was where they went. But here's the interesting thing. There's a cemetery, and uh, it was on the Sherman farm, which was five miles from the school. And Sherman was different because it was the last school, and it was actually built to provide a healthy environment, mo both emotionally and physically. And they had tons of food and stuff. But uh, in the reserva in the cemetery, which was far removed because nobody wants to actually see the cemetery when they go to visit the school. And I was, um, it had become a party place for people in Riverside. It had a grove of eucalyptus trees around it and the kids would pick up the headstones and toss them like frisbees and it was just a big mess. And so <clears throat> one day I was working at the museum at Sherman Indian School and this man came rushing in and he goes, oh my God, oh my God, I drive by this place every day and I thought, who'd put a pet cemetery out here? So I stopped and it's the cemetery for this school. What can I do? And he was a reporter. So he wrote an article, he interviewed me and I get a phone call from this woman and she goes, is this Dr. Jean Keller, the archeologist? And I go, yeah, because I'm an archeologist too. And she goes, we read the newspaper article, and my son needs to have an Eagle Scout project. He needs something. Can he do something? And I go, yes. And she goes, well, what do you need? And I go, oh, there's a huge list, because I was in charge. I had taken on this project of restoring the cemetery. And she goes, give us a list. He will do everything. Wow. And so uh, he did. He was 14 years old. He cleaned up six tons of trash from the cemetery. Uh, Pechanga paid for ground penetrating radar, and we found that there were, this was a fenced area, that there were graves outside. The cemetery had originally been one acre in size, and now it's one sixteenth of an acre, because they put Indiana Avenue through. And so Jason made um, headstones. There were 68 students buried there. He made new headstones for all of them that said, rest in peace. And we created a sage garden with four benches in the four sacred directions, planted uh, elderberry trees behind each, because elderberry trees grow with a shade canopy, and we planted four kinds of sage in the middle, and coast live oaks in the four corners of the fence. And in the, he did all of this himself. And in the research, we found out that the majority of students buried there were Navajo children. And the reason they were buried there is because of Navajo traditional beliefs about death. And when they died, they didn't want them to be brought home. And so most of the kids there came away to go to school and never went home again. And so we designed the cemetery with an open gate. And it became a place that we um, invited the public. It's in this area up against the hills but then there are housing developments all over the place. And so people were doing like off-road racing. They were digging up and building jumps and stuff. And so we had to educate them. And so we were out there one day and this guy and his kid had like an off-road motorcycle and they were digging up dirt right next to the fence. And I walked over to him and I said, do you know what this is? And he goes, no. And I go, it's a cemetery where Indian children are buried. And he goes, so? And I go, we found that there are several uh, burials outside the fence. And I said, now, I'm sure that you've seen what happens if you build on an Indian burial ground. <laughs> what do you think will happen to you if you dig one of those burials up? And he goes, oh. <laughs> and because of that, he spread the word to his other neighbors. And it became sort of a neighborhood project where they'd go in water and they'd pull weeds and on May 3rd the kids from Sherman and the neighbors come and put flowers on the graves and people come and sit at the benches and I tell them we want you there because we need to have these children have company. Their parents aren't here so you can be and so this became this big community thing where now the people that live in that neighborhood instead of digging up the dirt and building jumps come and hang out with the kids and pay their respects and um, it just ha had a nice ending because these kids you can imagine what that's like 
I can't imagine it, and I had to deal with it for years when I was doing my research. I still deal with it. And my mom used to live there, and she'd drive by, and she'd go, Jeannie, you better call Lori, because there's weeds growing up, and then pretty soon the weeds would be pulled, and people would stop by if they saw anybody messing around. They'd go, do you know what this is? And so it just became sort of a sense of community ownership of the lives of these children. So... But that's a long way to answer your question, is that during that period of time, only Navajos were allowed to enroll at Sherman, and unfortunately, a lot of them never went home again. Well, that, that puts it in perspective of why he was so proud of that school. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for coming. Thank you so much.